we would normally regather with a song. I'm not going to sing for you. We're just going to be seated. I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We're going to let those who are being baptized do most of the talking this morning. But I want to introduce baptism to us again. In John chapter 6, our Savior has just fed the masses. He created fish and bread out of nothing, demonstrating that he is, in fact, God in the flesh, able to provide for his people. But what Jesus was after in John chapter 6 was not a welfare program. It was not a a continual free lunch uh, for those who would follow him. In fact, those who had received this miracle and had seen the sign continued to pursue Jesus. In fact, tried to install him as king, and he went away quietly to pray. And they pursued him further expecting more miraculous free lunches. And they asked, in John chapter 6, verse 26, uh, Jesus says to them, Truly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, that is, not because you knew that I was God in the flesh and the promised Messiah and the one who could forgive your sins, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. And therefore the people said in verse 28, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? What a remarkable statement this is for people to have been exposed to God in the flesh, the Savior himself, the one who came to bear away the sins of all who would believe. And their question of Jesus is, okay, what do I have to do? I I, I like what I see here, and, and it's a really good deal to keep getting free food. What do I have to do to be in? And this is perhaps the response of, of anyone who at some point in life realizes, I don't have everything that I need. And maybe you're here today and you realize God is real and I will answer to him and I don't have what it takes to answer to him. I I need to clean some things up. I need to get some things right. And you might ask the question that the followers of Jesus were asking here in verse 28. What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And this is the natural human impulse to man's fundamental problem. God is holy and perfect, and he's just, and he's right, and you and I aren't. We sin in our activities because we sin out of our very nature. We do the things that are in keeping with who we are. Every single human being who has ever been born, except for the Lord Jesus Christ, was born a sinner, opposed to God in his ways, who who do by nature the very things that displease God and and will one day bring about the wrath of God. God will give to each man according to what he has done, and, and what we have done has been displeasing to him through and through. And the natural human response to the realization that I'm a sinner is, oh my goodness, I need to fix things. I need to start going to church. I need to clean up my life. I need to stop doing this activity. I need to start giving money to the poor. I need to do various things. What are the works of God that I must work in order that I might have eternal life? And the fundamental human impulse is to try to earn what cannot be earned. To try to merit what we could never merit. You see, no amount of doing good things could ever overwhelm all the ways we've offended our Maker. In fact, when we try to do good things, we as humans only bring polluted things and we create further offense to the one whom we must please. So Jesus' response to this natural human impulse is not, well, let me give you a list of things. Let me give you five pillars. Let me give you 18 works. Let me give you seven sacraments. He doesn't say any of those things. He says, verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in the one whom he has sent. That you believe. That is, you 
trust Jesus. You entrust yourself to Jesus. And with the fuller explanation of the New Testament, we understand that we are to fully trust what Jesus came and did by dying on the cross to pay for sins. You see, Jesus finished work at the cross of being a substitute to pay for the crimes of all who would ever believe is the only hope of salvation for humanity. You can't earn or deserve God's love. It is, in fact, a free gift of His grace to those who believe. Jesus goes on in John chapter 6 to say that no one comes to me except the Father draws him. And what we understand is that simple belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross is not something that a dead sinner can even produce in and of himself, but is something that God graciously provides as a gift. And if you're here this morning, you're about to hear testimonies of those in whom God has already done this work. And if you're here this morning and, and this hasn't happened for you, our prayer is that you would believe that you would surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and simply believe that His death on the cross actually pays for your sins. And by believing, you would have eternal life. These four who are coming this morning, Sharon, Stephanie, Susanna, and Jude, are not coming to be baptized in order to seal the deal of their walk with Christ. They're not coming to be born again. They're not coming to become Christians. They, in fact, already are Christians. They are already born again. The Holy Spirit of God has already done a work in their hearts, and you're going to hear the transforming power of God's grace in their lives. They have believed, and their lives have been transformed. And they are coming to give testimony of that transforming work of God's grace in the waters of baptism. I want to remind us of the truths in Romans chapter 6. Paul there describes what the emblem of baptism signifies. He says that we, Christians, have died to sin. He says in Romans 6, 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Immersion into Christ, symbolized by being baptized into water, is a symbol of being buried with Christ, united with Him in His death, and being raised to new life. You see, these four who are being baptized this morning have not cleaned up their act. They've not started getting things worked out. They, they didn't start cleaning themselves up by going to church or reading their Bible more or do some works or some things. They recognized, each of them, that they were a sinner before a holy God in need of something far more than they could ever produce. Something that was totally alien and foreign to their own abilities. They needed the grace of God to produce faith in Jesus and belief in Jesus Christ is the vehicle by which God provides a perfect righteousness they could never merit, they could never earn, they could never fix for themselves. It's simply a free gift of His grace that guarantees eternal life. So we're going to let them tell you what God has done in their lives. And we're going to have Stephanie Brooks come first. Stephanie, would you come and boast in your Savior? Hello, my name is Stephanie. I have attended Grace Bible Church for two years. Here's a little detail about myself. I was born in Chiprock, New Mexico, but I lived here in the valley most of my years. I have five beautiful children and a wonderful, supportive husband of 25 years, going on 26 this February. As for my parents, my mother is currently living in West Phoenix, as for my dad, he recently passed on this past year due to his heart condition, which I had the opportunity to spend with him. <clears throat> About my journey of how I got into this point in my life, 
and my spiritual walk with Christ, it goes somewhat like this. Ever since I was a young child, out of five siblings, I had a lot of responsibilities. My four brothers, my mother, and my, an endless amount of chores. I have tried to be pleasing, accepting, and respecting my parents' wishes, but for some reason, I was not enough. I remember going to various churches, a traditional church, a Mormon church, a Catholic, a Baptist, Assembly of God, a Pentecostal, including many tent revivals and camp meetings. Most of our directions, um, most of our direction points at the charismatic church of dancing and showing of signs and wanderings, healing, slayings in the spirit and allowed entertaining music. During my adolescent years, my family were going through many hardships, difficult and difficulties and trials, so I questioned God why. My life was not filled with the happiest memories. As a result, I rebelled against my parents and to God for many years due to many kinds of heartaches. Many years later, I moved on with my life by getting married and having my own family, and I thought if I find my own charismatic church, that would fix my life, but it did not. It made me question God even more, and my life got even more complicated. I continuously watched uh, Christian Network on TV, a health, wealth, wish it, think it, and it'll come to existence. I was raised in believing these false doctrines, which I thought it could change my life, but I was wrong. One early morning, I woke up from a strange voice that told me that I was found wanted like in the book of Daniel, not in a good way. I thought that was a sign from God of some sort, so I decided to sell all my possession and to move to another state. I packed a little items that we had left from the sale and started following a TV evangelist, hoping to find an answer and the truth about God. I was desperate and I got lost, and I was lost and confused. I was searching for God we end up on the East Coast where I followed a TV evangelist, but it was not what I expected. I was greatly disappointed. I didn't stop there. Day after day, I went to many libraries to study and read the Bi my Bible and search for the real truth, but in which books? Later, I came across a book from John MacArthur. The title was called Strange Fire. I read the book and I wanted to find out more and who is John MacArthur and what type of sermons he is teaching. So I searched up his name and found his sermon online. His teaching was different from whatever I, from what I ever had heard, but I was desperate, eager enough to learn more on God's words. As I struggled to accept these hard truths and sound doctrines, I had no time to close my mind. My soul was at stake. I had to break away from my false religion. All of a sudden, my heart was pounding so hard, beating painfully out of my chest. I became deeply afraid. My eyes and my ears were opening to the gospel. I've seen my own sins right in front of me so clearly. Once I saw my sins, I broke down and cried, screaming in agony, full of, full of tears and in pain, in desperation about how filthy I am. It took days and nights and months and months. I was trembling in great, great fear. I knew then I deserved God's wrath. I plead and repented to the one true living God to forgive me for all my sins. I was desperate and, I, and in need of God's word. I needed to find a true church that will teach me the truth. I was lost, I was desperate, wanting I desperately wanted God to discipline me right then and there. I figure I'd rather have God's discipline than, than having him to reject and deny me and discard me into a lake of fire. I continued to repent and fast. I didn't want God Almighty to judge me as a wretched sinner. There was no rest in my heart. There was no peace. It was violently in danger. So I begged and pleaded with God to have mercy on my soul. After months and months on end battling over my filthy heart and how disgusted and ashamed, I never knew how bad my sins were and how blind I was. 
I despised my own sin. I couldn't look at myself the same way. I thought of all the wretched things I have said and done throughout my whole life. I, was, I just couldn't stand myself anymore. I mourned over myself. Everything dramatically changed about me. I see everything around me so clearly. I seen everything around me so differently. The old world, the old life was gone. I had absolutely no desire or tolerance towards sin. Suddenly God's amazing gift of peace, love, joy, mercy, and grace reigned over me. For God pristined me, the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding for my future eternal glory. For I received the conversion and the regenerate of my heart by the Holy Spirit and the gift of faith in his Son, in the gospel, and in his word. I faithfully put my trust in the Lord of hosts, my, my shepherd, my counselor, my redeemer. I give all thanksgiving to the living God that he revealed himself to me through his word and his holiness, purity, and righteousness for God's word is alive and ultimate treasure. I give all honor, praises, and glory to my God. I love the Lord thy God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. I believe in, in my heavenly Father. I believe in the Son of God, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 10, 32 reads, Whoever confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. I fully proclaim the Lordship of Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. In my baptism today, I announce my public identification with Christ in which it stands as my public confession. In Acts 2.38 reads, Repent and be baptized, for I am being baptized according to the ordinance, a symbolic form out of the obedience to the command of my Lord and Savior, who took my place at the cross, who suffered and died dreadfully to secure my salvation, was buried and rose again for my justification by faith through grace, to walk with him in newness of life through perseverance, for I am kept by his power to the end in the mind of God. In sincere and humility, I declare this is my journey and testimony. Stephanie. Um, it is my pleasure, based on your testimony, and my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jude Ortiz, will you come boast in your Savior? Hi, my name is Jude Ortiz, and I've been going to Grace for about two years now. I was lucky to be born into a family that claimed to be Bible-believing Christians. Thanks to my mom, from a young age, I have been taught the Bible and that I am a, a wicked sinner. As a child, I was very eager to learn what the Bible had to teach. Since I was eager to learn and obey the rules, I was considered a good kid and was trusted by my family and those closest to us. When I was about seven years old, I begged and pleaded with my mom to let me get baptized. As I, read my, as I had read in my Bible that a Christian should get baptized, soon after this, my life began to resemble the parable of the sower and the seed. In my early years, my, my parents had fostered the seed of the gospel in my life and continued to as I grew up. But the cares of this world as I entered middle school and high school began to choke out the, my love for Christ. My mom would often talk about 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and that if I was saved, I would have victory in my trials, but that was not the case. As I, as I no longer had the eagerness that I had, I would often try to pray the prayer to try and resurrect my salvation. 
I slowly stopped reading my Bible and became tired of having no friends, and I decided to follow what the popular people in my class did in hopes of being like them. This led to a year and a half of sinning and no repentance, being miserable and still not being popular. My parents pulled me aside and talked to me about this period in my life and, if that, and that if any of this was worth it. They led me back to the word and talked to me about my repentance and the gospel. Since I was not saved during this period, high school was no easier. Even though I knew that I was sinning, that my sin was wrong, I still did not have the power to fight it. It was not until the end of my senior year when I was about 18 years old that God graciously let me get caught in my sin and I repented and began to see him change my life since then. I finally had this drive to want to learn and to know, get to know as much about God as possible and finally being successful in fighting my sin. I'm here to be baptized because God in his mercy, sending Jesus as the propitiation for my sins has changed me from a wicked sinner to giving me life in Christ. Jude, it is a joy to baptize you based on your testimony in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Susanna Dodd, would you come boast in your Savior? everybody, my name is Susanna Dodd, and I'm in seventh grade. When I was eight, right before my family and I moved to Papua New Guinea in order to preach the gospel, God saved me. I don't have a specific moment when I realized I needed a savior. What I do know is that after hearing the gospel told to me continuously by my parents that I needed a savior and I was a sinner and because of my sins, I deserved to go to hell, I believed. My dad, mom, and the Holy Spirit helped me grow in my love for God and his word. In God's sovereignty, I kept getting tonsillitis, and it got to the point where I could barely eat. So my family flew to the States so I could get surgery. That was when my dad was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. A tedious six months passed in which he got worse and then better and then worse. Finally, on July 18th, dad died. All throughout that time, God helped me to trust him. God has matured me over the years. Before I was saved, I was fine with disobeying my parents. I was disrespectful, prideful, and not very pleasant to be around. I was annoyed by my siblings and didn't try to be patient with them. I complained and rebelled against God. Since God changed my heart, I want to obey my parents and honor them because it honors God. God is so good. Even though I wouldn't choose that my dad would die, God used that experience to make me trust him and grow in him. However, I've come to realize that God doesn't just use huge, life-threatening trials to grow me. He also uses small trials, such as commands that I'm unhappy about, to help me realize a heart issue. God is loving and caring. He gave me his word to help me learn more about him. One of my favorite verses is, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the, to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 this verse means a lot to me because the word of God is actually living. It's not just some old history book that you just have to memorize. Without it in my heart every day, I don't desire to glorify God as much. It's active in my heart, causing me to glorify God. It's more than just a book. It is the word of God. It is engraved on my heart. Finally, it discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible tells me what it is to be a Christian and gives me assistance in every area of my life. It tells me what is right and wrong. Most of the verses in the Bible apply to my life today. It's so amazing that God knew what I would be facing in my daily life, and he put everything I needed to keep fresh in my mind every day. I am here to be baptized today because I want to glorify and obey God. That is it.
Susanna, based on your testimony, it is my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Sharon Baker, would you come share your testimony of God's grace? Good morning, my name is Sharon Baker, and I'm here to tell you what Christ has done in my life. I grew up in a Pentecostal-style church where I was taught that you choose to follow Christ by getting baptized, at which point you are made right with God or justified. Later, you are sanctified or cleansed in preparation for the new birth and the gift of the Holy Spirit. At the age of 13, I wasn't quite sure how all this worked, but I decided to get baptized anyway. Lots of other kids were doing it, and I was sure my parents were in great anticipation. So I prayed for God to forgive my sins, as my mom had encouraged, but I was only going with emotions. Romans 3.23 says that everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's high standard. I, unfortunately, had no remorse for being a sinner in rebellion against a righteous God. I justified my own sin by thinking I was a pretty good kid, denying what Jesus says in Luke 18.19, that no one is good except God. And I trusted my own heart, not knowing the wisdom of Jeremiah 17, 9 that says that the human heart is the most deceitful and desperately wicked thing. In those teen years after baptism, there was no evidence of change in my life because I didn't understand what true repentance looked like. I thought I could just add Jesus to my life like salt for my own convenience. Thus, I continued in my sinful ways going to church, fooling myself and others. In high school, I met Wesley Baker, the man who unbeknownst to me would become my husband years later. In college, he studied to be an airline pilot in southeastern Arizona, but shortly after, he was diagnosed with lymphoma at the age of 19. Though he did go into remission for two years after an autologous bone marrow transplant, the cancer continued to recur as he went to school. Meanwhile, I graduated college, got a job, and started working the eight to five. Not long after, I started seeing this guy from work, but months later, I was crying myself to sleep, praying for God to get me out of my mess and lead me to the right person. Through a series of events only God could have ordained, Wesley and I were married a year later, and not long after, he came to faith in Christ. I'll never forget when he told me that despite all the suffering he'd endured, he was thankful that God allowed him to have cancer because it truly humbled him. He admitted that he would have otherwise been an arrogant pilot somewhere on the East Coast, lost, never having found Christ. Not three years after we got married, Wesley had deteriorated significantly, and the doctors put him on hospice in our home. But it was killing me watching him waste away, so one day I took him to the ER where he was put in the ICU. After all the IVs and fluids, he was the smiley, chatty Wesley I hadn't seen in weeks, and I truly thought God had answered my prayer to heal him completely. One night, as I knelt down to pray, there was a certain feeling of the calm before the storm that I couldn't put my finger on. Wesley looked so good, but he was supposed to have cancer. He was on hospice, and all that we'd been through should have been a trial, but somehow I was not worried. My faith felt strong, and I could just see God bringing Wesley home healed. I said, Lord, was it that easy? I put my faith in you, and you healed him? Where's the test, the trial that you promised to those you love? How will I know if I have faith if it's not being tested? And just like that, not really knowing what I was asking for, I prayed for God to send me a trial to test my faith. And God answered, Wesley's body was beginning to drown with all the blood transfusions, and they put him on a vent, which he hated and tried desperately to remove. His wish would come true a couple of days later when the doctors announced that he, the cancer had reached his bones and he wouldn't survive the day. I asked him if he was ready to go with Jesus, and he nodded. He was sure, and I was shattered. Ten minutes after removing the vent, his pulse stopped, and he breathed his last peacefully. 
but I couldn't believe it. I turned to my brother-in-law for prayer. I knew God could raise the dead. Why not show his glory now? But the look he gave me said, that's not how it works. God would not raise Wesley from the dead that day. He had a different plan for my life. So I kept going to church, but I was very broken. After a year, I felt dead inside. Nothing satisfied me, and I was unhappy. I wondered why God would give me what I'd always wanted, a loving husband, only to take him away. I stopped going to church, and I fell off the wagon. I fell back into old sinful habits of the past, and I started to see someone else from work. I was looking for something, someone, to complete me. And when the, re when the relationship was a struggle, I tried to find joy in other things like shopping or eating out. I knew spending money on myself wouldn't satisfy, but I did it anyway. At one point, I began to go to a local coffee shop as an escape, and I'd tell myself, I'm allowed to have at least one guilty pleasure in life. At least it's not something worse. But deep down, I knew God was saying, you're looking for the ultimate satisfaction, but this isn't it. And despite my rebellion and sinful living, God was working in the midst of all the difficult situations, the hurt and the pain, and he was drawing me near to him. One providential day, by God's divine knowledge and wisdom, he led my childhood friend Lydia to send me a John MacArthur sermon that her sister Grace had shared with her. I was, however, very hesitant, having never heard sermons from any other church. So I prayed, Lord, I don't know this man, and I don't know if this is biblical, so please give me discernment to distinguish between solid and anti-scriptural teaching. Much to my surprise, the Bible was opened up so clearly, and the Lord led me to listen to more and more sermons till I was hooked. If I saw a title that was relevant to my life, I would listen to it. And because of such faithful expository preaching, I was learning so much about the Word of God. I don't know the exact moment of my salvation, but I know God began a good work in me, as Philippians 1 6 says, because my desires were now for Christ. I was being convicted of sin in my life, and my affections for the things of the world began to fade. I didn't understand it yet, but this was the Holy Spirit's work of progressive sanctification in me, because I was definitely not changing myself. Galatians 5.17 says that the Spirit gives us desires opposite to that of the sinful nature, and this was becoming evident in many ways. Previously, I had loved my sinful ways and the deeds of the flesh, which Galatians 5, 19 to 21 says include sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, hatred, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, drunkenness, and things of that nature. Galatians 6, 8 goes on to say that those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. In other words, as Romans 6, 23 puts it, the wages or the payment for my sin was death, as in eternal death. But thank God that there is hope because God offers eternal life as a free gift through faith in Jesus Christ. And by accepting this gift, my interest in this world was crucified to the cross of Christ and the world's interest in me also died, as Galatians 6.14 says. My desires were now for hearing songs that worshiped my God. The old secular songs I used to love became empty, void, and hopeless. Where before I used to binge watch Netflix, God began to put a bad taste in my mouth for the impure and ungodly. This and many more things God changed, and the changes were progressive over time. At one point, the sermons convicted me of the importance of being in community with believers, and I began to pray for the Lord to lead me to a church like John MacArthur's with faithful expository preaching of the word of God. I confessed I didn't know where to start. But one day he answered, never having been to the Fuddruckers on Priest and Elliot, I got out of the car on a Friday night, looked up at the bright sign that said Grace Bible Church and thought, sounds too much like John MacArthur's Grace Community Church to be coincidence. <laughs> that Sunday I came and it was here during the Romans 6 series that I finally understood the purpose of baptism which is to broadcast the change that God has already accomplished in a person, not the means for accomplishing the change. Just like a sign on the freeway broadcasting icy roads doesn't make ice appear on the road, 
So baptism doesn't bring about the new birth in someone's life. Baptism is the sign on the road, a person's public expression of their repentance, a turning 180 degrees from sin to follow Christ. God, in response, justifies them, making them right with God. It was then I realized that when I got baptized before God changed me, that was my doing, my work, not God's. I was trying to help God along when scripture clearly says in Galatians 2.16 that no one can be made right with God by simply following the rules. Today, I am thankful that God brought me here, where I'm constantly reminded of the gospel, the gospel, the good news, that Jesus came to save sinners by his death on the cross. I came to Christ in humility and repentance acknowledging that I required God's divine accomplishment alone to change my life, not Jesus plus my own efforts. Ephesians 2, 8-9 says, It is by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, that we are saved. And this salvation is not by our own doing. It is a free gift from God. It is not a result of any human achievement so that no one can boast. Then it is God alone who gets the glory and I am here to be baptized to boast in my Savior and what he has done in my life. Sharon, based on your testimony, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to hear of what you have done in these lives. Reminds us of our own salvation, to think about what it meant to be separated from you by our sin, and what it meant to be rescued by the blood of your Son, to begin to be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit and have the guarantee of eternal life. God, we pray even in these moments, that you would bring conviction of sin and conviction of new life in Christ to those who do not yet know. Would you be pleased to rescue some even today and grant eternal life in Jesus' name? Amen. This is also Membership Sunday. This is an opportunity for us to recognize those who desire to formally commit to membership at Grace Bible Church. And it's interesting to notice the various metaphors that God gives for the church in Scripture. A building, a flock, a physical body. In each one of those metaphors, the various parts of those are intimately linked with the other parts. In other words, a, a brick doesn't serve its own purposes by being alone on the sidewalk. A brick lives up to the reason for which it was formed by being connected to other bricks in the structure which make up a building. Likewise, a part of a body, an elbow perhaps, doesn't function very well all by itself. But an elbow in interdependent organic connection to a forearm and an upper arm serves very well what an elbow was intended to do. And the church is also metaphorically referred to as a flock with sheep and shepherds. And these shepherds tend sheep and they care for sheep and protect and feed sheep. Each one of these metaphors is significant in portraying the relationship that a believer has to the local church as not one of casual participation, but intimate connection, interdependent, organic interaction. And so, these who are coming forward for membership today see their need of being formally connected to Grace Bible Church. The formal membership process at Grace Bible Church allows us to uh, effect something of a, of a similarity to what the early church would have experienced. If you read through the book of Acts and you watch from the birth of the church in Acts 2 to the growth and the development of churches not only in Jerusalem but Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, you see believers being recognized and counted and cared for. You see believers submitting to local leadership. You see the pastors in churches actually caring for individuals. 
All of these things in Scripture indicate a, a, a very intentional, not a casual relationship of believers to the local church. And so a formal membership process at Grace Bible Church allows people to become formally connected to the church. In a day when it's perhaps easy to view a, a church as a proprietor, something of a marketplace, you can go from uh, one church to another church. If you like the music better over there, if you like the messaging better over there, you can just go across the street to another church. We sort of have a, a tendency in, in our society today to just go from place to place to place and, and not dive in deep and connect the way the New Testament describes that we should be connected to one another. So those who have placed a, a desire uh, to be members at Grace Bible Church have gone through a process of discovering the doctrines at Grace Bible Church. What does the church believe? What does the church teach? What do the elders and pastors uh, intend to uh, care for the body with in terms of doctrine? They've also explored the various ministries of the church and ways to get involved in the church. And, and by becoming members, they're expressly asking for accountability to the doctrine and practice of the church. They're eager to be uh, counted and cared for well. The other thing that the membership process at Grace Bible Church affords is an opportunity to dispel assumptions about what people believe. All who are members at Grace Bible Church have gone through a process and an interview with a, one of the pastors at the church where they give their testimony of salvation in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so as far as a profession goes and, and our ability to assess a profession, those who are members are regenerate believers in Jesus Christ. And they have also uh, let us know that they are committed to the doctrine and the teaching and the practices of Grace Bible Church. What we're going to do in a moment is have the new members come forward, and I'll call them forward by name in just a moment, and we'll have the current members of Grace Bible Church stand up where you are, and we're going to read together the covenant of commitment to Grace Bible Church. And if you're not yet a member of Grace Bible Church, we, won't, we don't want you to feel bad because you're sitting and everybody else is standing. This is just a way for us to recognize those who have already gone through this process and to speak out loud together the covenant commitments that we've, get, we've made together as members at Grace Bible Church. So with all that being said, I'm going to invite the following up. And Paul Boucher, I can't tell you what a thrill it is to invite you uh, to come forward. I think we've tried this three times. And... Uh, Everything's aligned here today. Paul Boucher, Micah Britton, Stephanie Brooks, Chuck and Becky Canode, Jay and Jan Duffus, Abby Klingenberg, Tyler Coglin, Gabriel and Jennifer Lopez, Mark Michaud, Tom and Sue Olmsted, Jude Ortiz, Carolyn Pace, Ryan and Christina Reed, Matt and Janelle Schneider. And that's the list I have. If, if you went through the membership class and somehow I've left out your name, just raise your hand. We'll do a quick interview process. I just don't want to leave anybody out. <laughs> Everybody accounted for? Okay, fantastic. All right, we're going to put the covenant up on the screen. You can turn around and, oh, look, it's on the back. You can face that screen or this screen. And uh, we're going to read this together. So all of you who are members of Grace Bible Church, go ahead and stand up. And we're going to read this covenant out loud together. Here we go. Humbly trusting that God has graciously brought us to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and having been baptized upon our profession of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in dependence upon God's gracious help, solemnly enter into covenant with one another. We will pray for and be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the church, being a peacemaker with all in the church. We will walk together in brotherly love, exercising an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, faithfully encouraging, admonishing, and entreating one another as occasion may require, seeking with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows, being slow to take offense and quick to forgive and reconcile with one another. We will strive for the advancement of this church for Christ's sake by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, by remaining faithful to God's word concerning our biblical doctrines, church discipline, the Lord's table, and believer's baptism, 
by exercising the spiritual gifts given to us as members of the body of Christ, by giving cheerfully and sacrificially to support the gospel ministry of the church as it extends both into this community and the nations. We will seek to live boldly as witnesses for Jesus Christ where God has placed us, living a transformed life and proclaiming the gospel that the mission of Jesus Christ might advance in this world. We will persevere in raising our children under God's watchful care, that they might, by his grace, repent and believe in the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. We will, if we move from this church as soon as possible, unite with another local church where we can obediently live under God's word in fellowship and where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant in the body of Christ. All right, we would like to invite the elders, the pastors of Grace Bible Church to come down at this time. One last thing remains, that is the right hand of fellowship. So all of the elders will make their way down and welcome all of these new members. Let's give them a hand. Welcome these new members to Grace Bible Church. <laughs>